Welcome. Thank you for being here. If you wouldn't mind giving us a like and consider going ahead and subscribing as well, that would be fantastic. And if you really want to go the extra mile, go down to the description below and click the Patreon link. Lots of cool stuff going on there. As always, I love you and enjoy the show, guys. Chrysalis, a story by user Beaverfur. Chapter 13 As far as prisons went, Dowcott thought, he couldn't complain. His current cell in the Empyrean Palace easily outclassed his own apartment back at the Council's embassy building. It was composed of four rooms, a bedroom with a terrace overlooking the gardens, a bathroom, a large office, and a meeting area that doubled as a small theater and media room thanks to the vid projectors covering an entire wall. The palace might have been an ancient building more than 400 years old, but that didn't mean it was an antiquated one. The Republic had made sure their seat of government was always up-to-date, seamlessly weaving modern technology into the old-fashioned, sumptuous architecture of the building. There was a foldable kitchen station that deployed from one of the walls, the main bed had an anti-gravity comfort function, the hieroglyphs in the office room hid presence sensors, vid projectors, auxiliary lights, and audio speakers. Even the large ornate seats could adjust their shape to different body sizes, easily detecting and shifting to fit Daokot's comparatively small and slender body frame. And yet, despite all this luxury, he was still a prisoner. He had been a prisoner for the last few days. The main door was locked, with one or two guards always there. The terrace wasn't accessible, and the rooms themselves were apparently EM-shielded, preventing any kind of radio transmission from getting in or out. Thankfully, he wasn't completely isolated from the outside world. The vid projectors still had access to the public broadcasts, so even if he was prevented from sending messages out, he could still follow the events that were developing outside. Daucott hadn't expected to get any reliable information out of the public broadcasts, after all, one of the key tenets of any coup was to quickly take control not only of the centers of executive power, but also the flow of information the public had access to. Taking over broadcast stations, shutting off data networks and vid transmissions. But that hadn't happened. The stations seemed to remain independent, and the information in the broadcasts still appeared genuine. From what Daucott was gathering, the only place the coup had successfully seized control of was the Empyrean Palace itself. He wondered what that meant. It could be that the coup had failed to take hold elsewhere and devolved into a mere hostage-taking situation at the palace. But if that were the case, the news stations should have reported fighting at those other locations too by now, if only in passing. But there was no mention of any attempts at taking over the other centers of power in Zunvir. It was almost as if the coup leaders had forgotten about anything other than the Imperium Palace. Daucott knew that it was always hard to reach valid conclusions when working under the severe limitations he was under. Nakstani had always remarked the critical importance of gathering good information. No matter how smart you were, if you worked out of erroneous intelligence, your assumptions would always turn out to be wrong. But despite that, he thought he knew enough by now to tentatively discard the idea of the Anasax tribe plotting to take over the Republic's government that this was some attempt at getting into power and replacing the Emperor. It just didn't fit. But what other options could there be for this? He tried to put himself in the mind of the Anasax leaders, tried to think like they were thinking. Maybe they were playing the long game. With their major planet, Anasax Farvan, in disarray, the tribe was poised to lose a large part of its economical power over the next years. If the Zunvir Republic survived, that is. In that case, they might be trying to force some sort of internal crisis that pitted the remaining tribes against each other. If all the other tribes started fighting for control of an eroded central government, that would buy Anasax some time to rebuild before anyone else could take advantage of their weakened position. But Daucott doubted they would go for such a dangerously suicidal strategy. 
It risked an internal civil war that would lead the entirety of the Republic, Anasak's tribe included, even more exposed to the attacks of the real enemy, the Terran, weaker than they already were. No, it wasn't that. There was no sense in defending against a potential future threat when an actual horrific one was right at your doorstep. Whatever this was about, he knew it must be related to the Terran. Daukat shook his head, gazing out the window at the night sky. He couldn't see them, but he knew the troops were still out there. The coup participants had fortified inside the palace, and the soldiers of the other tribes still loyal to the emperor and the republic's government were surrounding the building and hiding among the garden's trees. No, this coup, he was sure of it, was going to fail eventually. It was meant to fail, right from its very conception. So why attempt it in the first place? A smokescreen? A distraction? Maybe, but for what? Or maybe not. Not a distraction. Maybe he was forgetting about something. The Empyrean Palace itself. During his time with Nakstani, Dalkot had started to see the palace mainly as a place of diplomacy and political intrigue, of official receptions, extravagant celebrations, and bitter, underhanded negotiations. But it was also much more than that. It was the seat of government of an interstellar nation, after all. There were entire wings of the expansive building he had never visited, that were off-limits to any outsider. The residential parts of the palace, of course, but also those that contained the war rooms, government computer servers, transmitter arrays, quantum communicators. Could that be it? Not really a coup, but an assault on the Empyrean Palace itself. It would have granted the Anasax tribe a short window of opportunity, a short time frame in which they would have had access to the palace's central computers and communications systems, in which they could have sent out any order under the pretense that it was coming from a trusted source. Right until the remaining high-ranking government officials gathered their wits about what was happening and cut the palace off from the government networks. A very, very short time in which the Anasax tribe would have had unopposed control over the Republic's remaining military forces and communications channels, but to do what, exactly? Whatever orders they could have given would have been retracted soon enough by the rest of the surviving government. Except, of course, that some things couldn't be so easily retracted. If a warship had gone into warp as a result of a malicious order, it might take days before it returned to normal space and contact could be established again. At any rate, Daukat knew he wasn't in direct danger, Whatever the true intent of the coup attempt was, he would be respected. No tribe could risk making an enemy of the Galactic Council by hurting one of its ambassadors. No, his forced reclusion was simply a way of keeping him from interfering. Not that it made it any less awful. As comfortable as his cell was, he couldn't help but to feel bored beyond belief. Boredom. It was a state of mind Daukat had little experience with. Ever since he started his career in the Council's diplomatic corps, there had always been something to do, something to work at, be it an upcoming examination, messages to write, reports to read, never enough time to get bored. Even those periods in warp time were measured subjectively in minutes and hours at the most rather than days. He connected the vid projector again, though his eyes glazed over the three-dimensional images. It was something he had seen before, a reconstruction of the Battle of Anasax Farvan, the maneuvers and countermaneuvers of the Council fleet and the Terran swarm. The narrator's upbeat voice was trying to put an optimistic tone to it, remarking how the Council's EM distortion field had managed to disrupt the Terran's attack plan and cause it to lose its entire swarm. Little mention was made of how the Council itself had lost an entire fleet. He was starting to fall asleep when the image suddenly changed. A large text in bold glyphs, flashing in and out, along with a piercing noise. His augmented irises kicked in, translating the text on the fly. Alert. Immediate evacuation order. Hostile fleet on approach to Zunvir. Evacuate to local refuges now. Follow orders from tribal authorities. Expect use of nuclear weapons. Expect radioactive fallout. Daukat jumped out of the seat, his heart beating fast. He blinked hard, 
almost thinking his irises were malfunctioning, but the text didn't change. He stood frozen for a few seconds, considering his options. Not that he had many trapped in here. Could he try to break a window and descend the outer wall? Even if he could actually make a dent in the reinforced glass, he doubted he would make it to the ground without falling. He couldn't help but to smirk at the irony of it all, at having escaped the colony world of Yavit just to arrive right in time for the destruction of Zunvir. In the end, he didn't have to make a choice. The main door to his suite opened and three Zunvirian soldiers entered, carrying weapons and wearing the Anasax tribe's colored stripes. You! shouted the one in the lead. We leave! You come! Daukat nodded and followed the group out of the door and into a long corridor with short ceilings and wooden floors. The leading soldier put a large hand on his shoulder, unnecessarily forcing him to walk at a fast pace. At least they weren't pointing their weapons at him. Daukat didn't know if he should feel glad for that or slightly insulted that they didn't consider him a threat at all. The palace had plunged into a frenzy of activity. There were squads of soldiers running along the corridors, dodging the crates and boxes scattered all over the place. Groups of captive staff workers were evacuating, escorted by the Anasax troops. Here and there, someone shouted orders that were ignored, the palace workers more scared by the ominous message in the vid projectors than by those who had taken them hostage. How much time do we have? Daukat asked the leading soldier in his little squad. The Zunvirian looked down at him, as if debating whether to answer or not. Or maybe he hadn't understood the question. It didn't look as if he had a very firm grasp of the council's interlanguage. When will the warp tunnel collapse? Daukat asked instead. At that, the soldier reacted. None, he said. Already here. Daukat blinked. No warning time at all? But that's not possible. The soldier's mouth tentacles raised slightly but he didn't say anything else, instead forcing the squad to rush ahead of another group of civilians that were converging into the same corridor. It wasn't possible, Daukat knew. The warp tunnel would have been detected hours before its collapse, just like in Yavit, either by the remaining Zunvirian authorities or the rearguard fleet the Council had in orbit around the capital planet. The only way they could have missed the approaching Terran in warp was if it had requested a valid flight plan ahead of time. The image of the murderous machine filling out the digital paperwork and submitting a flight plan of its attack for approval was ludicrous and almost made Daukot burst into laughter right then and there. Except that, of course, someone else could have submitted the flight plan, inserted it directly into the database. Say, someone with direct access to the Republic's military computers with the authority of the Imperium Palace, the seat of government itself. The thought didn't feel that funny anymore. His group descended a long flight of stairs and entered a different corridor. This one Daukot recognized, with its marble columns and ornate walls. It was one of the major wide corridors crossing the entire palace north to south and linking the different wings together. They turned left and started walking in the same direction most of the other Zunvirians were moving to evacuate. When they crossed a stationary group in high-ranking military officer apparel, Daukot's irises activated and an icon flashed on top of one of the Zunvirians with his name and basic information. Someone Daukot had met before, and that he had judged important enough to add to the facial recognition function of the irises. He read the displayed text. Derriker of the Anasax tribe. Tribe leader. He remembered the Zunvirian now. Daukat had met him during his first visit to Anasax Farvan some time ago, along with Nakstani. He was one of the leaders of his tribe, though he was in charge of the business operations rather than political contacts. Daukat had never seen him in the Imperium Palace before, let alone dressed in a military outfit, apparently leading a coup. Not that the military garments fit him well, though, the Zunvirian lacked the confidence and projected self-assurance common among the generals and fleet admirals Daukot was used to seeing. It was apparent he was a businessman playing soldier. Daukot waited until they were passing right by the stationary group, and then he stopped suddenly. The soldiers escorting him tried to force him to resume walking, but he turned to face the tribe leader. Derricker, he shouted. The Anasax leader turned to face him, 
surprised. Then he made some sort of hand gesture directed at the soldiers, who visibly relaxed. Ah, yes, the new ambassador. His voice was smooth and precise, probably the result of many years practicing the council's language, Dalcat thought. My apologies, I don't recall your name, but there will be time to get acquainted again once we have both evacuated the planet. Also, I hope you can understand why the need of having you lodged in the guests... Betraying your people? Dalcott interrupted, his voice raw and almost shouting. Betraying the council! For the Terran! Why? Derricker's mouth tentacles trembled slightly. Then his head bobbed. I see. Nuxtani was always astute. I shouldn't have expected any less from her successor. You gave it an opening, didn't you? You sneaked a false flight plan in so that the Terran could blindside the defending forces. The Zinvirian stood silent for a few long seconds before replying. Yes, he said, at last. We did. We also ordered half the defending forces around the planet to warp away under a false pretense. We also sent the Terran all the confidential records in the Emperor's possession regarding the destruction of its species, as well as the codes of the planetary defense stations and the locations of the remaining fleets of both the Council and the Zunvirian Republic. Daukat was speechless. The treason, the extent of the betrayal and its consequences, with their focus on civil liberties and economical freedoms, the Anasax tribe had originally been one of the major forces behind the Empire's transformation into a republic, and one of the Council's natural allies in the political reforms program. This... this was unexpected. Just... why? This is suicidal, Daukat asked. Not so much. The Zunvirian paused as if remembering something. Hmm. You have been told the story of the Bone Titans, yes? This is not the time for a lesson on myths and legend, Derricker. Ah, I'm afraid you are correct once more, so I'll make haste. In the story, the town of Neckett was attacked by great lumbering creatures made of bone. The titans were invincible, impervious to both lance and arrow. The town's leaders were desperate, their tribe facing a complete annihilation at the hands of the monsters, until one of them... Derricker, please. Yes, yes, to make a long story short, they figured what the titans wanted. Bones. Fresh ones. So the oldest of the town elders decided to sacrifice himself. His fresh bones were put in a ditch at the entrance of the town. And it worked. The next time the titans returned, they didn't destroy any house or farm. They just scooped the bones and left the way they came. So they kept the tradition, and every five years the oldest member of the town would be sacrificed. No more again had the town of Neckett to worry about the monsters. Daukat nodded, understanding. You're talking about appeasement. Indeed. The Terran seeks justice, yes? Or vengeance, as your Grand Minister aptly noted in his conversation with the machine. So we... decided to deliver what it wants. We gave it the information the location of the emperor and the seat of government, and the names of those tribes that were involved in the genocide and its subsequent cover-up. You can't be serious. The Terran's conception of justice involves the complete extermination of the Zunvir Republic. Ah, but you are not talking to a tribe leader of the Zunvir Republic anymore, my dear friend. I am now Minister Derricker of the newly formed nation of Anasaks, a new market democracy that has just declared its independence from the Zunvir Republic. Daukat shook his head. That is... The Terran won't care about... The Terran will understand that we are on its side, Derricker said, his voice shaking. It will understand that the Anasax tribe always was against the militaristic expansion of the Empire, and that our people always were the underdogs always fighting for freedom and justice, a pitted enemy of those who destroyed its own species. If anything, we, f we fought our best to prevent tragedies like that, even if we didn't always succeed. Daukat sighed. 
Much as he didn't want to admit it, the Anasax tribe's plan might actually work. His own experience with the Terran led him to believe that the Replicator had a very binary worldview. Either it tried to kill you, or it would go out of its way to save you, like it had done with Daukat himself and his pilot Telzira. So if the Anasax tribe managed to get onto the Terran's good side, maybe by way of triggering its reciprocity, they had good chances of surviving this whole thing unscathed. Better chances than even the Council itself, Daukat reflected. Still, it was wrong. You're scared, he said. I know, scared of what another attack on Anasax Farvin might do. But this, this is wrong, Derricker. Even if you survive, you will be doing so at the cost of hundreds of millions of innocent lives. And how many innocent lives are there on Anasax Farvin, Ambassador? What would you expect us to do? He shouted. You can afford to be self-righteous, yes? Because it's not your world that is targeted for destruction. It's not your friends who will die. Not your tribe, your... He paused as if searching for the word. Family! We don't have the luxury of your elevated morals anymore. So we must look out for our people, for our own tribe first. Dalcott nodded, defeated. It was wrong. It was clearly wrong. And even the tribe leader in front of him knew that it was wrong. If his shaking voice was any indication. That it was a form of cowardice. But what could he expect? In light of the widespread destruction. Of the inevitable genocide. He could understand the logic, the calculations. After all, wasn't it better if at least some part of the Zunvirian species survived? Or was survival not worth it? If saving yourself required you to push others into the path of destruction, if it meant you had to turn into a monster, hard to say. His own people had never had to face such a dilemma, and he hoped they would find some way to stop the Terran before it came to that. Or to negotiate a ceasefire somehow. Which reminded him of the conversation the Grand Minister had with the machine right before the battle over the industrial planet. When reviewing the transcriptions, he couldn't help but to notice how harsh and cold the Zacharnine had been. Dalcott had been trying to figure how he would have approached the Terran instead. Let me talk to it, Dalcott blurted out. What? Give me a communication channel with the Terran, whatever you use to send it the information before. I think, I believe I can reason with it. Ambassador, there is no time for that. Besides, it has already been tried. No, he said. Not properly. Not by me. I had contact with its machines back in Yavit. Maybe it will still remember me. Derricker looked conflicted. Ambassador, this palace will be destroyed. Perhaps this entire planet. We can't remain here. Dalcott clenched his fists. I'm not asking you to stay. You can leave. Just give me that channel first. I won't be leaving any of my subordinates here, either. If you stay, you will do so on your own, with no way to evacuate. Dalcott paused for a second. Suddenly this decision had become serious. Important in a way no other decision he had ever made was. He felt tempted to follow the Zenvirian's recommendation to evacuate the planet to abandon the idea or maybe talk to the Terran from the relative safety of a spaceship. Except that putting himself in danger was part of his plan. It had to be. The idea was simple. The Terran had saved him once, so it might save him twice. The hope was that, if the Terran knew Dalcott was down here, it would refrain from an indiscriminate attack against the planet, that it would be forced to examine the nature of its morality pitting its thirst for justice right against that little core of empathy that Daukat hoped still existed. Or maybe it wouldn't work and he would be disintegrated along with the palace itself. 
But still, if there was even the slightest chance that he could save millions of innocent Zunvirian lives... Dalkot closed his eyes, uncertain. He thought of Nakstani, of what she would have done in his place. But of course he knew exactly what her opinion would have been. This was the frontier, after all. He gave the Anasax tribe leader a curt nod, more to reassure himself than anything else. I know what I'm doing, Derricker. You and your people can leave, but open that channel for me first, please. Derricker gave him a nod. An actual nod. Which looked out of place with the Zunvirian's heavy head. Very well. I hope your counsel won't blame us for your loss, yes? Before Dalcott could reply, Derricker had already turned to give instructions to the soldier, escorting him in their own language. The soldier didn't look happy, but he acknowledged the orders and started walking towards a side corridor, motioning Dalcott to follow. He did, not bothering to say goodbye to the Anasax leader. As soon as they got out of the main corridor, the soldiers started running, and Dalcott struggled to follow. They passed empty offices and heavily decorated rooms, the soldier stopping from time to time to unlock the electronic safety latches of a door, then waiting just enough for Dalcott to pass through before taking the lead again. Every minute felt eternal, as if fire would start raining out of the sky at any moment. Dalcott felt guilty at putting the soldier in this dire situation, risking being left behind by his comrades if they took too long. So he pushed himself to run harder and faster. They raced along marbled corridors, their steps against the smooth floors echoing in the recently vacated rooms they crossed. Dalcott wondered if the two of them would be the only ones left inside the sprawling Imperium Palace, if everyone else but them had evacuated already. Maybe the Emperor was here, too, locked inside a room, waiting to be destroyed by the Terran. Like some sort of twisted blood sacrifice for a vengeful god. He pushed those thoughts aside as they entered a large war room, its round walls covered in vid projectors, showing an orbital view of the battle raging outside. Apparently the Terran had already engaged the meager defensive forces and its main enormous ship was pushing its way through their positions. The planetary defense stations were nowhere to be found. The soldier activated a console, pushing a large chair out of the way. They waited as the screen loaded, then he pointed at a tactile icon. Press and talk, he said. Dalcott was about to say something, but the soldier had already turned on his feet and was running towards the door. Uh... Thanks, Dalcott said to the now empty room. He focused on the icon, wondering what to say, how to approach it, what his first words would be. Dalcott noticed that his hands were trembling. He realized then that this had been a very stupid idea, a potentially lethal one. Every time he had tried addressing the Terran's machines back at Yavit, they had remained silent. It had ignored his pleas, comments, and harsh remarks. Why would it be any different now? The worst, Dalcott knew, was that he would feel incredibly stupid if the Terran didn't reply, and it turned out he had uselessly wasted his life in such a pointless task. He closed his eyes, trying to relax his muscles. He noticed he was still gasping for air after his run. He had to be optimistic, though. But still, how to approach it? He tried to let go of his fears and review what he knew, like he had done back at the dinner reception so long ago, try to see what he had missed before. With his eyes closed, he could almost imagine Nakstani sitting right beside him, looking at him. He could picture her predatory smirk. Tell me, kid, how did the Zacharnine fuck up? He thought he was in a position of superiority. Dalcott said to the empty room that their military display would act as a deterrent. The council having a countermeasure only reinforced that belief. Hmm. That's true, but that wasn't why he failed, was it? Dalcott reflected. Since the Terran had let them escape the destroyed colony world, Dalcott had suspected that there was some sort of latent sentience inside the machine, some traces of empathy. 
No, Dowcott said. He failed to engage the Terran at an empathic level. He treated it as an enemy from the start. So what should you do, then? Dowcott opened his eyes and pressed the console's icon. A light next to it changed color to blue, and a text message appeared, indicating the language cipher was connected. He paused for a second, clearing his head of any doubt, of any worry. Then he took a deep breath. Hi, he said. My name is Dowcott. We met before in Yavit, the first colony world you attacked. I was one of the survivors in the crashed spaceship, the one you rescued. He paused, but no reply came through. He felt a growing worry. I... I just wanted to thank you for saving my life. You know, mine and Telshira's. And I thought that maybe that you might want to talk. Just that. Talk. No strings attached. He waited a few seconds. Still no reply. Dowcott shook his head. This had been a very, very stupid mistake. But it was too late to run away now. He had lost that chance already. So, with nothing else to do, he just kept talking. I mean, I'm not sure if you remember me. You made us a replacement ship, and... Dowcott had listened to the recording of the voice the Terran had used to talk to the Council before. A synthetic voice, yes, but one that still sounded natural. The one that came through the speakers, interrupting him, it was different. Still recognizable, but it had definitely changed. Now it sounded distorted and flat, lacking any intonation. It sounded mechanical, like rusted gears scraping against each other. It was the voice of a nightmare, of an emotionless terror. The voice of one of those bone titans the tribe leader had mentioned before a voice that sent a cold shiver running down Dowcott's spine. Yes, the monster said. I remember you. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one today. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you, as always. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Go down into the uh, description. Hit the Patreon link. You'll be the first to see updates and news and all sorts of fun stuff. Join our newsletter! Um, <laughs> and, of course, the community over on Discord is always popping. Uh, a lot of stuff going on over there. A lot of fun stuff. A lot of conversations about a lot of weird shit, okay, guys? Um, but anyway, guys... As always, I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, I love you. I'll talk to you later. Bye, y'all.